from historically famous bed and breakfasts stained with blood and rumored to hold the ghosts of all those who were murdered within, to sprawling private estates where evil men once chose to end marriages in ways that wouldn't result in alimony. Who's ready to delve into the most haunted murder houses in the United States? Number 5. Kreischer Mansion Kreischer Mansion is a historic home located within the Charleston neighborhood of Staten Island in New York City, New York, that was initially one of two mansions built by German immigrant Balthasar Kreischer for his two sons, but that's now the only one that remains standing. In 1835, the Great Fire of New York swept the city, destroying much in its path. The following year, in 1836, brick baron Balthasar Kreischer would move to New York from Germany to begin producing bricks, which were in astronomically high demand following the devastation, in order to rebuild a more fireproof city. To accommodate his family of seven children, in 1885, Kreischer constructed two identical mansions atop a hill for two of his three sons, Edward and Charles. In 1894, following a slew of business troubles, Edward B. Kreischer would take his own life by way of self-inflicted gunshot wound, with some stories stating the suicide occurred within the house while others somewhere nearby. Charles's mansion burned to the ground through the Great Depression, with Edward's property later being passed from owner to owner over the years, and usually sitting empty aside from a caretaker or visits from those with a morbid curiosity. In 2005, Joseph Young, also known as Joe Black, a hitman for the Bonanno crime family, was acting caretaker for the home. Joe, accompanied by three other men, attacked and killed rival mob associate Robert McKelvey on the property, with Joe stabbing the target as he ran for the door and the others grabbing and attempting to strangle him. The struggle spilled into the front yard, where it took all four of them to wrestle and eventually drown Robert in the small, grave-shaped pond out front. When it was all said and done, the killers took McKelvey's body to the basement, where they dismembered and disposed of it in the home's coal-burning furnace. Today, Kreischer Mansion stands as a historic landmark, offering up tours, concerts, and all manner of community events. In May of 2020, the property was approved for the construction of condos surrounding the historic home through the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The property is rumored to be haunted by a number of apparitions from its rather tragic history, including that of Edward's wife, whose screams and sobs are often heard emanating from empty rooms, and of Edward himself, who has been sighted rounding corners in a hurry, sometimes followed by a phantom gunshot. Reported all across the property are a host of apparitions in old-fashioned clothing, shadowy figures sighted darting about, disembodied footsteps, extreme cold spots, whispering from thin air, and the constant feeling of being watched or followed. The sound of a scuffle and splashing have been heard from the front yard, and several have described smelling burning flesh in the basement, accompanied by a general eerie feeling. Also reported throughout the house are doors slamming on their own, lights turning off by themselves, and the pitter-patter of children's footsteps always heard from just out of sight. One local legend tells a German cook was murdered in the kitchen and that his spirit can be heard clanking pots and pans together. Lastly, several children were said to have been locked in closets as punishment, and many report hearing scratching sounds coming from said closets that, when opened, are found completely empty. Number 4. Taliesin Taliesin, also referred to as Taliesin East, Taliesin Spring Green, or Taliesin North, and located about two and a half miles to the south of the village of Spring Green in Iowa County, Wisconsin, is a property famous for once acting as the estate, home, and studio of renowned American architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank moved to the area in 1911, setting his sights on the property and constructing Taliesin with his mistress, Martha Mama Borthwick Cheney. Martha had left her husband for Frank, but Frank's wife refused to sign the divorce papers, forcing the couple to go on the run seeking refuge. On the afternoon of August 15th in 1914, Wright was in Chicago for work when Martha and her two children, 8-year-old Martha and 12-year-old John, sat down for lunch on the porch of Taliesin. Inside the main dining room, the Wright's workmen gathered around the table to be served their lunch by Julian Carlton, a handyman from Barbados, whose wife's cooking was highly praised. 
Seemingly out of the blue, Julian instructed his wife to leave, grabbed an axe, and murdered both Martha and her children where they sat. He then locked all the exits to the house, doused the porch in gasoline, and set it ablaze. Many laborers jumped through windows to escape, only to be finished off by Julian and his axe. Out of everyone, only three managed to get away for help, though one later died of severe wounds. Of the household, seven of the nine present perished in the attack. Julian was discovered later in the basement furnace of the house, having swallowed muriatic acid. He never gave a motive for the attack and died weeks later from starvation. Afterwards, it was confirmed that Borthwick had fired the Carltons and that they were due back in Chicago that night. Wright rebuilt Taliesin, but in 1925, faulty wiring caused another blaze. The home was once again reconstructed, and in 1932, Wright established a fellowship for architectural students at the estate. Upon his death in 1959, the estate was left to the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. In 1992, Taliesin Preservation Incorporated was founded to preserve the building and grounds. The estate's School of Architecture was closed in June of 2020, with the building continuing to operate as a museum. The property is thought to be haunted by the spirits of those killed in Julian's violent attack, the most prevalent of which might just be Martha. What's believed to be the ghost of Martha has been sighted wandering the home and grounds in a white dress. Her presence is described as peaceful by almost all who have encountered her, but visibly restless, seemingly adrift. Martha's body was buried near while the children were taken back to Chicago and cremated by their father, some say causing her soul's unrest and forcing her to go on searching for all eternity. Across the house, many report doors and windows opening and closing on their own, lights flicking from on to off by themselves, and the smell of smoke with no origin. Several stories tell of staff locking up for the night only to find everything open back up when they arrive in the morning. Lastly, many entering Taliesin also report sighting the small, shadowy forms of children seemingly sneaking about, disembodied footsteps, voices from thin air, a host of apparitions in old-fashioned clothing, and the nearly constant feeling of being watched by someone or something unseen. Number 3. The Lizzie Borden House the Lizzie Borden House, or officially the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum, is a historic home turned tourist attraction that's located in Fall River, Massachusetts, and that's grown in infamy for the murders of Andrew and Abby Borden. The property was first purchased by Andrew in 1872, after which he launched a full remodel to make it suitable for himself, his new wife, and his two daughters, Emma and Lizzie. As it's recorded, the girls are said to have gotten along great with their stepmother publicly, but many suspect tensions were always present, repressed, causing a slow fester over the years. On August 4th of 1892, Andrew and Abby Borden were found dead, hacked to death by an axe within their home. Abby's body was discovered upstairs, apparently ambushed while she was tending chores, while Andrew's was laid across the couch in the position he would have been in while taking a nap, his head split nearly in two. Lizzie was named as the prime suspect, with only herself and the maid present at the time of attack. She was arrested and put on trial, with proceedings garnering national attention, but was eventually acquitted against strong public disapproval. Lizzie remains the prime suspect to this day. During her trial, Lizzie remained in Fall River, but afterwards would move to Maplecroft, a nearby estate where she would reside until her death in 1927. In 1996, her old family property was inherited by one Martha McGinn, whose grandparents had purchased the home in 1948. Martha restored the property to its original appearance, opening it up as a bed and breakfast. The Lizzie Borden House remains open to the public, offering up both tours and overnight stays for the brave. It's been restored to the very day of the murders, with photographs and memorabilia of the case readily on display. The home is thought to be haunted by the apparitions of Abby, Andrew, and surprisingly Lizzie herself, all of which who have been encountered across the property, sometimes simply living out their lives from the past while at others reliving that fateful night. Many entering the home report being instantly overcome by a feeling of dread and unease, as if they're unwelcomed. Reported across the premises are strange banging sounds from empty rooms, otherworldly cold spots, disembodied voices and footsteps, high EMF levels, and chilling EVPs. 
Doors and objects have been known to move on their own, shadowy figures are frequently sighted darting about, and many report feeling as if they're constantly being watched or followed by something unseen. In the room where Abby was killed, a number of guests report being awakened by a presence standing over them, and a sort of white mist has been sighted and even photographed within. Interestingly enough, fire alarms within the home have a habit of going off for no reason whatsoever. While staff has claimed it's probably due to old wiring, they seemingly go off every few weeks on a schedule and always between 3 and 4 in the morning. Lastly, and most disturbingly, a number of first-hand accounts detail instances in which individuals have actually been attacked by the spirit of Lizzie, who's said to rush with the utmost ferocity, hitting, grabbing, pushing, and scratching at any who cross her path. It's said that if you're feeling really brave, you can conjure Lizzie on her home turf by reciting the famous words, Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Number 2. The Soudan House the Soudan House, located in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles, California, is a residence turn landmark and event venue that was originally designed by notable architect Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., son of the very same Frank Lloyd Wright previously mentioned. The home is noted for its facade, which, depending on the cultural references one picks up, can resemble anything from a Mayan temple to the open mouth of a shark. The residence was originally constructed in 1926 for painter and photographer John Soudan, who desired a home he could entertain large parties at between his friends and the Hollywood community. Due to widespread criticism of the home's style, however, Soudan sold the property in 1930 to one Ruth Rand Barnett. The residence was sold again in 1936, in 1944, and in 1945 when it was finally purchased by one Dr. George Hodel, a physician out of Los Angeles. Hodel lived in the home with his many children and their mothers while taking various lovers over the years. In 1945, following a suspicious overdose leading to the death of his secretary, Ruth Spaulding, Hodel came under fire for murder. On January 15th of 1947, actress Elizabeth Short was found murdered. Her body cut into two pieces at the waist and mutilated in a vacant lot in the Limert Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. As many are probably already aware, her slaying had her dubbed the Black Dahlia and has been the premise for a number of conspiracy theories and even several high-end productions over the years. There were a number of suspects listed, Hodel included due to his medical knowledge and an accused relationship with Short. While no one was ever charged, Hodel remained in the public eye as a suspect and probable killer for the rest of his days. In 1949, Hodel was arrested on charges related to heinous acts performed on his own daughter, but was acquitted and fled the country in 1950, which many believed only further solidified the awful truth. Upon his departure, Hodel sold the old property, and for a time, it remained a private family residence. In 2001, then-owner Zoran Balbes restored the home, converting its three-room kitchen into one larger combined kitchen, while updating the bathrooms and installing a pool and jacuzzi in the central courtyard. Today, the home is owned by Dan Goldfarb, founder of Canapet, a CBD company targeting domestic animals. He lives there along with his wife, Jenny Landers, with the couple hosting a number of live performances and community events each year. The Soudan House is also a popular location for filming and for photo shoots. George Hodel's son, Steve, went on to become a detective for the LAPD and, after discovering photos resembling Short among his father's possessions, launched his own personal investigation. He went public with his suspicions in 2003 in his book Black Dahlia Avenger, which theorizes that his father tortured and murdered Short in their basement before dumping her body on the lot. Steve went on to accuse his father of many more murders, claiming that there were bodies spread across the land within and surrounding the Soudan property. One legend tells that after George fled the country, a mysterious elderly woman appeared at the front door of the home, babbling intimate knowledge of the house and its former owners, and claiming that the property was a place of pure evil. All across the grounds, many report disembodied footsteps, voices and whispers from thin air, shadowy figures sighted slinking about, and the sound of heavy chains clinking and dragging. 
The spirit of a man thought to be George has been sighted across the property, many theorizing returning to the place he felt free in life, along with a number of additional apparitions thought to be his many victims all varying in description. A number of informal investigations have turned up high EMF levels, disturbing EVPs, strange half-formed images in the backgrounds of photographs, and the constant feeling of a negative energy looming. Lastly, and on a lighter note, current owners have claimed that their pet cats seemingly keep spirits and their energy at bay, as they've experienced nothing but peace since moving in. Number 1. The Velisca Axe Murder House the Velisca Axe Murder House, also known as the Josiah B. and Sarah Moore House, and located off East 2nd Street in Velisca, Iowa, is a residence infamous for being the site of the brutal slaying of eight people, including six children, in 1912. The house was originally constructed in 1868 by one George Loomis, with Josiah Moore purchasing the property in 1903 for himself, his wife, their two eldest children, and, unbeknownst to them at the time, two children they'd welcome following their move. On the morning of Sunday, June 9th of 1912, Lena and Ina Stillinger went to church where they met with the Moors, with Catherine Moore asking them to stay the night at the Moore family home. The next morning, at about 5 a.m., the Moors' neighbor Mary stepped into her front yard to hang laundry. She noted the Moors' house was unusually quiet and still for a Monday morning. A couple hours later, Mary went to check on the family, knocking loudly on the door and checking for any signs of life. Eventually, she called Josiah's brother, Ross, for help. Ross arrived and tried to get the attention of anyone who might be inside. When he failed, he let himself in with a spare key. It said Ross didn't make it past the first bedroom before having to leave the home while instructing Mary to call the police. Sometime during the night, all six members present in the Moore home, including the two Stillinger girls, had their skulls crushed in methodically with an axe. Sadly, it said the investigation was a running joke, with more than 100 townspeople let into the home to see the brutal scene. The murder weapon, an axe belonging to Josiah, was found in the house next to a slab of bacon. The doors were all locked from the inside, and all victims' faces had been covered by their nightcloths. Though several suspects were named, the murderer or murderers were never caught. In 1915, the Old Moore property was purchased up by one J.H. Giesman, which was the first out of seven consecutive owners the house would see over the following years, until finally in 1994, it was purchased by one Darwin Lynn. Lynn, along with his wife Martha, restored the home to its original 1912 condition, opening it up to the public as we know it today. In present times, the house looks very much as it did the night of the murders and offers both daytime tours and overnight stays for those feeling extra brave. A number of families have moved into and out of the house over the years, while at times it's been rented out by its various owners. Most who have had the fortune, whether it be good or bad, to stay within the old Moore house have reported its intense paranormal activity as being one of, if not the main reason for their seeking a change of residence. The property has always held a strong cult following, but gained further attention following an incident in 2014, when a paranormal researcher conducting an investigation there suffered self-inflicted stab wounds that apparently later couldn't be explained. While intricate details of this incident were never fully released, many wonder if he was possessed or affected by an evil presence. A number of tours of the home have been cut short due to paranormal activity getting just a bit too extreme, and several psychics have confirmed the presence of multiple entities, even managing to commune with a handful. Reported across the property are strange anomalies in videos, half-formed shapes that appear later in photographs, and chilling EVPs. Disturbingly, several guests have been trapped within the downstairs closet, in the room where Ina and Lena were killed. While some think this may be the ghost of the killer, or simply random results of present supernatural energy, others have theorized it may actually be the ghostly Ina or Lena attempting to keep others safe from sharing their grisly fates. Also reported throughout the old house are disembodied children's voices heard from empty rooms, objects sighted moving or flying around, and the sound of heavy footsteps sometimes seemingly in pursuit of a set of children's footsteps. In the attic, where cigarette butts were found, and where some have theorized the killer may actually have hid as the family got ready for bed, many have reported feeling a dark presence. Several have recounted feeling threatened, and a handful have even described being hit, scratched, or pushed by unseen hands. 
Lastly, the shadowy figure of a man wielding an axe has been sighted most often in the hallway, usually startling all nearby. Several have awakened in the middle of the night to find this figure standing over them, even plunging his axe straight towards them, only to fade right before impact, swallowed up into the surrounding darkness. Coupling a history that's about as fascinating as it is utterly horrifying with a seemingly endless slew of paranormal phenomena and urban legends, there's no doubt in our minds the Velisca Axe Murder House is by far the best choice as the most haunted murder house in the United States. Thank you all for tuning in to our list of the most haunted murder houses in the United States. If you enjoyed hearing our histories and ghost stories as much as we enjoyed telling them to you, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn notifications on so you know when fresh content is on the way. Throw us a like if you feel we've earned it, and most importantly, share this video and our channel with anyone you think could use a good scare. We'll catch you all next time, if something else doesn't first.